what I regard as a new frontier in the um, discovery of exoplanets in understanding the population. And uh, I've, I've highlighted two upcoming missions in the title here, one from the European Space Agency, which may or may not do this kind of science. I hope it will. But this other one definitely will, the, uh, the NASA, NASA goes to space telescope. So I'll talk, about, I'll talk about those and what role they're going to play in all this. Right. OK, so before I, I'm going to concentrate on a particular technique on, on gravitational lensing as a method for detecting exoplanets. But before I do so, let's set the context by talking about some of the other methods very, very briefly. Um, and, you know, the, the most obvious one, for, for, for the benefit of those who may not have taken the exoplanets course, you, you might have a question, you know, why can't we just image exoplanets directly? And the answer is we can, but only very nearby. And, uh, for instance, we can around this system here, Beta Victorus, but you can see the reason why perhaps we generally can't, because you know, just look how the light from Beta Victorus bleeds out into, into neighboring pixels, and, and its solar system is buried right in underneath that brightness. So even that nearby star is a really tough challenge. You've got to use adaptive optics, you've got to, be, uh, you've got to use coronography to, to uh, basically um, uh, you know, very, very carefully uh, block out the, the central light as much as possible. But in this case, you know, they do see planets, and actually, or a planet, and this has been observed over a number of years, and, and you know, you've got an unmistakable signature here of a, a very, very large Jupiter-type body orbiting the central star. The central star is blocked out here by the chronograph. Um, so this kind of technique re relies on the planet being very, very massive, so that it shines quite brightly in the, typically in the, in the infrared, which is where these techniques work best, um, and also that they're separated from their host by a very large amount, being far further away from their host, typically than Jupiter would be from ours. Um, the technique that most of you would be familiar with, and the one that has so far given us the most number of exoplanets, is the transit method. Uh, intuitively, that's a very, very straightforward technique. You have um, a planetary system that happens to be inclined almost uh, edge on to us so that we see a dip in the host star light as the planet passes in front. And then basically, the size of this dip is directly related to the ratio of the surface area for the host star and the planet. So we get a small dip for a small planet, a big dip for a big planet. And uh, for a multiple planet system, we'll see several dips. Um, and so from that, we get the size of the planet relative to its host, we get the period of the planet. Uh, that in turn, once we know about the host star, which generally we do, we can we, we know how hot the planet is, you know, how far away from the host star is, and, and the luminosity of the star gives us the temperature of the, of the planet. And so we, we actually learn quite a lot from transiting systems, and indeed they're the systems we use uh, uh, to probe planet atmospheres and things like that. I'm not going to talk about probing planet atmospheres, although that is an area we also do some work on here at Manchester. Uh, but it's transiting systems that are, that are used generally to, to probe planet atmospheres. Right, so uh, the two big missions, one of which is now finished some time ago, another is currently ongoing, uh, that are searching for transits, so is Kepler and, uh, and TESS. Uh, and they employ different strategies. So Kepler focused in a, in a region of about 100 square degrees, uh, quite close to the galactic plane, and it did, so it, it went kind of narrow in the sky, but very deep. So it found you know, thousands of planets within that search volume. The trouble is, um, most of those are too far away for us to follow up from the ground to do things like atmospheric studies and stuff like that. And so that laid the groundwork then for TESS. So TESS um, is an all-sky survey, but it's much less sensitive. It goes much less deep than Kepler, but the overall volume, because it's much larger solid angle, the overall volume is comparable to perhaps even larger than Kepler. But the big thing is, all of its planets will be, or the vast majority of these, uh, will be potentially able to be followed up from the ground in case of the atmospheric studies and so forth. So that's the, you know, that's the real game changer. TESS is, is really going to uh, you know, revolutionise the, the industry of planetary characterisation. Okay, so deliver a lot of candidates. 
Oops, in the way. Um, so Kepler left us with this uh, massive crunch of, of planets here, so we're plotting planet size in, in terms of its radius versus orbital period, log log scale. And this was this was what the ground-based transit searches have given us. Uh, this is slightly out of date now, but it, it's it's roughly the same. Um, and you can see you know how Kepler doesn't just increase the volume of planets, but it also pushes the sensitivity right down to uh, you know Earth and in, in, deep, in some cases sub-Earth-sized planets. So it really has been a game changer uh, for understanding the demography of planets down to, to Earth-like planets. And I always like to give this comparison to kind of um, portray an engi the engineering challenge, because the science is only half, but the engineering challenge is also fantastic. What does Kepler need to do to find an Earth-sized planet around a sun-like star? Well, it's designed to measure down to, the, uh, an Earth will block out 80 parts per million of the sun, okay? And Kepler is designed to be able to reach that level, 80 parts per million, for a 12th magnitude uh, G-type star, okay? When you think a 12th magnitude, seventh magnitude is about the very faintest we can see with the naked eye in the very darkest skies, okay? Certainly not here in Manchester, but in the very darkest skies. So 12th magnitude is a fact a hundred fainter than that, and around something that faint, you're looking for an 80 parts per million variation. So I always give this an analog, uh, it's a, this is a cold plane concert. Imagine there's 10,000 people here, they're waving 10,000 mobile phones in the air. Um, if you put Kepler halfway to the moon, not only will it see those 10,000 mobile phone torches, it'll be able to tell if one of them was turned off. Okay, that's that's the, the sensitivity. Um, Anyway, TESS is where it's at right now, and uh, we've been playing around with some, some test data ourselves in Manchester, and quality is looking really, really beautiful. We've been testing a, a new transit fitting code that we've been developing, um, and this, this is just one illustration of the, the quality of the data from TESS. So TESS has been observing a number of planets, so, so here's WASP-91b. You can see it's been seeing several transits, and each of those spikes is a transit. And uh, one of these spikes magnified up, looks like this. And once we fit into our code, it looks like this. And then we do that with all the transits and sort of fold them over themselves. You get this really, really beautiful stacked light curve here. And then the red data are where we've rebinned all this dense time series back to a sampling of one transit, which is like every two minutes. Okay, so we've re re been back to that effective sampling. Of course, we improve the signal to noise by root n of the number of observations within a two minute bin. Uh, we get this absolutely beautiful uh, light curve. And these signals are just so flat. Okay, so really wonderful data from, from TESS. Um, but moving on, because I want to talk a bit about my furnacing, uh, radio velocity, of course, is another major method for detecting exoplanets. And uh, there, we, you know, the, the idea is you're detecting uh, the Doppler signature, the gravitational wobble of the host star uh, in, re in reflex motion to an orbiting planet. Uh, probably one of the main results from, from radio velocity team so far has been the uh, discovery of Proxima b and indeed Proxima c since then. So Proxima b is a planet orbiting uh, Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to us. And this planet is uh, an Earth-sized, we don't know precisely its mass because there's an uncertainty in the inclination angle, but it's, it's approximately Earth-sized and it's also in the habitable zone. We know that from the period of this, uh, of this signal. Okay, so the very nearest star to us has an Earth or a super-Earth in its habitable zone. That already suggests that Earths or super-Earths are very common and Kepler indeed confirms that the you know, Earth-like planets are Earth-like in the sense of mass or size are, are pretty common. A quick heads up for Gaia. Gaia is an astrometry mission, so it's measuring, very carefully measuring the positions and motions of stars in six-dimensional phase space. Okay, it's been doing that since 2013, but the next catalog should um, include thousands of exoplanets that are observed as a result of tiny astrometric wiggles in the host stars, okay? It's kind of like the, 
the orthogonal counterpart to radial velocity. Instead of seeing the backwards and forwards motion of those stars, we're seeing the sky motion, okay, through astrometric movement. So, um, and the wonderful thing about this is that you can actually solve fully for a three-dimensional orbit. You don't get just the projection of the orbit, you get the deprojected orbit because you apply Kepler's law, equal areas swept in equal times, and so you can use that to deproject the orbit. Um, so that's going to be fantastic to get that. And you can see the sensitivity here. Uh, so here's, here's transits and radial velocity. You can see a nice sort of sensitivity peaking out at sort of 1 AU for, for the kinds of stars that, that, that uh, Gaia will be sensitive to. So that's going to be really exciting data set in that box. So this is, uh, this is how roughly how the planets look. Uh, this is probably a year or so ago, so 4,000 then, there are 5,000 now, so it doesn't look a lot different. Semi-major axis versus planet mass, uh, color-coded by detection techniques, not the colors don't to show very well here, but uh, the key thing is, yes, there are lots of planets, but this structure, most of this structure is not real. This, this is observational bias. For instance, here, we've got a massive pile of Jupiter mass planets close in, so these are hot Jupiters, and the reason there's so many is simply because um, any time a transit team finds a hot Jupiter, the radio velocity teams jump on it because they can measure directly the mass of a transiting planet. The transit guys measure the radius, and so the two of those give you the density. So you begin to do planet characterization with those kinds of measurements. So that's why there's such a focus here on hot Jupiters. They're actually pretty rare, hot Jupiters. Okay, but because of their value in terms of constraining composition, they are strongly overrepresented in these, in these dots. These white dots are our solar system. And so it's immediately obvious here that actually of all the several thousand planets we've found so far, they don't appear to look much like the architecture of our solar system. Now again, there's nothing real about that. It's simply observational bias. It's simply because our, our, the sensitivity of our observational methods runs out, okay? And in fact, the sort of dark green dots that aren't very visible here, they're the closest that we get to solar system analogs, and they are what this technique of microlensing is giving us. Okay, so the direct imaging, things like beta pictorials that are way up there, this pink stuff is the radio velocity um, results, this is transit radio velocity, and we've got transits down here, uh, and these green ones are pushing down towards solar system analogs. So that is one reason why microlensing is important. It's very important to uh, probe how common or unusual is the architecture of our solar system. Okay, so I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about gravitational lensing. And normally we're kind of used to these sort of images when we think about gravitational lensing, right? We, we think of the sort of cosmological context in which we see it. So here's a, a massive CD galaxy, a massive galaxy in the center of a cluster, and its gravitational potential is lensing uh, a, a background galaxy, and you can see there's sort of multiple images. These, these sort of uh, dense regions here are probably the same part of the galaxy being multiply imaged. And this is really useful as cosmological probe to weigh the galaxy clusters, to, to image galaxies that would otherwise be too faint. Uh, you know, so lots and lots of really great uses. Um, but if we would come back in five billion years, that image would look the same. Okay, it's not, it's a, essentially, it's a, to our intense purposes, it's a static picture. The time scales for those galaxies to move with respect to each other appreciably is you know, of order of EDA. Okay? So that's a static view. In microlensing, we've got a dynamic view. Okay? So the situation here is that we've got an observer, we've got a background star, referred to as the source, and then somewhere intervening is, is a lens, a, a, you know, a star, a planet, whatever it is. And this thing is moving across the line of sight at an appreciable rate over human time scales, days, weeks, months. Okay? So what's happening is when it gets very close, within a characteristic t um, distance given by its Einstein radius, you can think of that as the, the characteristic cross-section for a gravitational lensing to be significant, then we get multiple images being produced of this source. So in this simple case of a single point-like lens, this source would be lensed into two images. One image would appear to be um, somewhat less magnified and would appear inside the Einstein radius as we, as we see it here back on Earth. The other would be 
um, a larger, more magnified image lying slightly outside the Einstein radius. But the thing is that this, the angular scale of this is literally, for, for a solar mass lens, is milli arc seconds. So we can't resolve those images apart. They're too close to each other. So we don't see these separate images. We don't see the view that Hubble, etc., gives us of galaxies. We see just the combined brightness of those two images. But because it's a dynamic situation, this lens is moving across the line of sight, then that geometry changes, the magnification changes. And so instead of a snapshot picture with arcs, instead we get a, a time series where the brightness changes in a very characteristic way that we can model as being due to gravitational lensing. Um, and so you, know, you can model it very, very simply with rectilinear motion across a length scale given by the Einstein radius. This, this length scale goes essentially as the square root of the mass of a lens. And so for a given velocity across the line of sight, the time scale, essentially the time spent inside the Einstein radius, will also go as the square root of the lens mass. So for a star mass lens, a solar mass lens, over galactic distances, these signals last for weeks to months. Okay, so for a planet the mass of Jupiter, Jupiter is a thousand times less massive than the Sun, so square root of that is roughly 30 times shorter, it's a order a day. For Earth, a thousand times, a million times less massive than the Sun, uh, you're talking about an hour or so, okay? But that's still detectable, it's quite demanding, but it's, it's detectable. So um, it, because it has a dependence but a weak dependence on mass, this is potentially sensitive. We can see signals down to you know, basically the mass of the moon. Okay. And this is the signal, this is obviously a model, but this, these are models of the signals that we get. It really depends on that closest approach. Okay, So ultimately, how, how closely aligned on the sky does the star get to the lens at minimum impact? That determines the height of these peaks. Okay, So it's just, just geometry here. Uh, but typically, you know, this is magnification on the log scale here, so you know, the effect can be very dramatic. And then for a highly aligned system, as you can see, magnification is factor 100. Okay? And, uh, I've seen events where magnification is factor 1,000 or more, several thousand. So you know, they're rare, but they can happen. Um, I've got to show this. It's a glossy animation which my PhD students um, and I put together uh, which uh, basically, um, it was part of a press release. So this is showing where we have to look, and there's a nice animation. This is, this is David with his wonderful GPU ray tracing simulations showing how the signal evolves <coughs> and what we would see if we had like a telescope of infinite resolution. Okay? So we see the time series. Uh, and what David also, it, so David's getting invited next week, he's just submitted his thesis recently, uh, and a, a, a big chunk, I'm going to talk quite a bit about some of the work he's been doing. One of the things he did was construct these wonderful maps uh, which show where in the galaxy we expect the most microlensing events. Okay? So this is the rate of events per year per square degree. Um, this, these are available online, so these are you can punch in your survey parameters and uh, it will give you a real-time calculation of the maps. Uh, this is state of the art. No one else in the world has maps as accurate as this, and this has been tested against the distribution of 8,000 microlensing events from one of the leading surveys overall. And certainly, no one has maps that, that are producible in real time like this. So, David's done a fantastic job doing this. And uh, this is crucial. We need to understand the distribution of events in detail because the surveys that are going to be looking at planets aren't going to be able to scan large areas of the sky. They're going to have to focus on small regions, so it's important we put them, in, place them in the right place, basically, where, where the hot spots, where, where they're going to see a lot of events. Uh, this is an optical map. The, the surveys I'm going to talk about are near-infrared, but we can produce near-infrared maps as well. If you go to the website, you'll be able to use them yourself. Right, so uh, the model I showed you before was a single lens passing in front of a line of sight and you get this nice, simple, sort of bell-shaped curve. For planets around a host star, that's a binary lens system. Both of them have an action on the, on, on the magnification, okay? And the single lens case is nice and circularly symmetric, it's nice and simple. As soon as you introduce another lens, 
you essentially, your, your gravitational lens becomes astigmatic. And instead of having a nice focal point at the back, and it's not a true focal point, but a nice caustic, a, a point of, of uh, convergence of your light rays, instead your caustics, the convergent points, become um, sort of lines, okay? Uh, and they may be joined together, they may be disjointed, as in this case. And exactly what pattern these caustics are will depend on the mass ratio of the planet to the host star. So here's a binary star system here. So what happens is we get a source, we're in the rest frame of the lens here, and we get a source star passing somehow across this plot. Wherever it strikes a red line, it's mathematically, its magnification is, it diverges, okay? If it's a true point source. Now, real stars have a physical side, so in actual fact, there is a limit to that magnification because only an infinitesimally small region of the source star will lie on the caustic at any one time. So the, the integrated magnification is always finite, but nonetheless, what you typically get if a source star passes across one of these caustics, you get a burst here, Another burst here, so a track like that, you get a sort of horn-shaped feature as it passes across. Okay, that's a classic binary caustic crossing event. And the geometry of these caustics, you know, if we vary the mass ratio from this sort of binary star case to a, a sort of a, a super Jupiter sun-like star case, uh, that bends the caustics <coughs> around, okay, because we've got this, this, you know, this, this difference in mass ratio. So the, I should say the, the planet and host star are aligned along the um, y equals zero line here, okay, so they're, they're along this axis here. So these caustics bend in one direction uh, uh, for, for uh, non-unity mass ratios. And you can see they bend even more and they start to shrink as well as the mass ratio gets smaller and smaller and smaller. In the limit that this tends to zero, these disappear and you're left with the point-like caustic line directly behind the single lens, i.e. you recover the single lens solution as you would expect. Okay, so you can appreciate from this that the light codes can be very sensitive to precisely what is the track of the source star across here. You know, a, a, a light curve that cuts across here is going to be very different from a light curve that cuts across here. It's going to be very different again from a light curve that goes straight down there. So there's now a, a whole zoo of possible light curves, even for a single geometry. So you can appreciate it, start, it starts to become really difficult to model these things. But their signals are quite unmistakable from astrophysically variable stars. And there's no question, when you see one of these light curves, it looks nothing like anything else. You know it's gravitational density, it's just a real pain to grind the models and, and get the best fit solutions. Uh, so this is some examples of, you know, theoretical examples of light curves. Uh, depending on where the source passes across the caustic. So this is um, a separation between the planet and host of 0.7 times the Einstein radius of the host and a mass ratio of 0.01, so you can see these strongly bent caustics. And you can see this looks like a, pretty much like a single lens event. There's some small perturbation there, but there's not much evidence of that. Here the peak is all spiky because we've passed essentially across the central caustic. Whereas over here, we get a spike after the main event because we've crossed one of these bent over these so-called planetary courses. So this signal, we've got a main signal here, which is basically the gravitational signal from the host star, and then we've got a perturbation due to the planet. The main signal, time scales, as I said before, weeks to months. This signal here will have a time scale that's root Q times shorter, so order a day for Jupiter, order an hour. And this is a real one. So this, this really uh, kind of uh, put microlensing as a, on, on the map as, as, as a planet technique. Uh, you can see in the, the Ogle survey here, their data is showing in black. They, they're able to issue real-time alerts quite early on then. They're already quite confident this thing is a microlensing event, at, even at this point. And so then we get a lot of other follow-up survey teams take that alert from Ogle and they keep into action. So each color is a different survey, follow-up survey team. They get this beautifully dense time series, and probably they're thinking of switching to another target by this point, but then bang, we get this blip here. And here's a zoom of that blip, and the, the solid line is the best fit model. And the best fit model is basically a five Earth mass planet um, at a few AU from, from its host star. So uh, this is unmistakable uh, as, a, as a planet signal. 
And you know, it's been going a few years now. It's quite tough to do from the ground. And the real issue is we have to look in very, very crowded fields. I showed you the model that David produced. We're looking at the galactic center, very rich star fields. And the reason is because microlensing is rare. We need milli arc second alignment between the background source star and the foreground lens. Probability of that, even towards the galactic center, is of order of million to one. So you have to mo monitor hundreds of millions of stars to see of order of hundreds of events every year. And only a small fraction of order of a few percent of those will have planets that are in just the right position to give some kind of perturbation on those light curves. Okay? So it really is a needle in, in multiple haystacks of years. So over the years, the ground-based survey teams, they've worked hard. What they're noticing from their detections, you can see it's still quite noisy, uh, but there seems to be a turnover in the mass ratio Q. So this is kind of abundance of planets here versus the mass ratio, the planets to host mass ratio. Um, it looks like it peaks, and it peaks at a, at a sort of a super-Earth type regime here. Okay? Um, and this seems to be universal. This, this mass ratio function is seen in, in transit data you know, too, as well as in microlensing data. So it's kind of interesting, it may be pointing to the mass ratio as being the, the kind of universal way of, of understanding the formation of planets. Another key area that microlensing can help us with is these sort of this, the enigma of free floating planets. There is tentative evidence, or there has been tentative evidence, of the existence of planets that appear to have just an isolated signal. No signal from the host star. They aren't a perturbation, they're just a tiny single lens signal lasting hours or days. And that's really puzzling. And in fact, the, the early data uh, from the, the MOA survey uh, showed this massive hump that corresponded to one day time scales. And these guys concluded that there were a board of two Jupiter mass planets for every star in our galaxy. Free floating planets, unbound from any host star. And that was a real head scratcher for planet formation theories. How do you have so many massive planets unbound from their host star? There's, you know, the two plausible mechanisms is somehow they're just forming by themselves the same way as stars. So they're not kind of planets, they're just cores of stars that never become stars. Um, the other is that somehow they're getting kicked out from the planetary system, but it's really tough to kick out a Jupiter. <coughs> so so that, that's really tough to explain. And there's so many of them, that's what this survey was suggesting. But then a few years later, the Ogle survey, analyzing a much, much larger sample of events, found no evidence at all. So here was the MOA prediction, and they didn't see, they didn't see anything one day, but instead they see this climb up of events at uh, kind of on hours time scales. The error bars here are big, and so the authors themselves are saying, you know, we've got to be careful, this is right at the edge of our sensitivity. But the current prediction from Ogle is that there aren't two Jupiters per, per you know, two free floating Jupiters per, per star, but there may be somewhere between five and ten Earth mass free floating planets per star. Okay, well that's that causes the planet formation theorists not to lose as much sleep. It's a lot of planets, but they're much lower mass, so it's easier to get them kicked down. Um, but it is at the edge of the sensitivity of Ogle, so we need to test this scenario. And the only really, the best way to test it ultimately is to do this from space. Okay. So, the story of space based microns, it begins actually with Kepler. Um, a few years ago, so it did its main survey of finding transiting planets, and then some of its gyroscopes failed. And NASA was thinking of packing it in because you, know, you need very precise pointing to get all that beautiful photometry. Uh, but then a group of people suggested that actually, if Kepler could be just confined to observing the, the galactic plane, you could steer it around using uh, solar radiation. Just the radiation, you know, just radiation pressure from the sun and its remaining gyroscopes to sort of give it a reasonable level of precision. So NASA bought into that and organised a series of campaigns. You can see here, this is uh, sorry, the ecliptic plane. This is the galactic plane, but it has to be confined to the ecliptic plane. Basically, 
fixed orientation relative to the sun and earth. Um, so th there was a series of campaigns. Uh, one of these campaigns, Campaign 9, as you can see, is very close to the galactic center, and it's decided that would be a micro campaign. So Kepler spent a few months staring at the galactic center uh, looking for micro -lensing. Now, it's got this enormous, greatly wonderful focal plane. Unfortunately, it's not got the telemetry rate to send the photometry from all of the stars in the galactic center that fall within that plane. In fact, it only has enough data rate to send photometry for about 3 million stars. So we had to fix on a so-called super stamp, a tiny region sort of down here, where there were, it contained 3 million stars and it had the highest predicted microlensing rate. And so Kepler sent photometry on those. So most of the rest of it we couldn't get data on, but we got uh, a sort of super stamp region down here. And um, for years and years and years, this data sort of sat there unprocessed. And the reason is because, um, well, if I forward a couple, the reason is this. This is the ground-based view of some of the best, highest resolution telescopes. This is the Canada France Hawaii telescope ground-based image. That same region to Kepler looks like this. Its pixels are huge. So sadly, although it's in space above the Earth's atmosphere, it's four arc second pixels make photometry an absolute nightmare when you're looking at such crowded fields. Okay, each of these pixels typically contains many, many stars. That wasn't a problem for its main transit survey campaign, where it's looking far away from the galactic center and, and we didn't have this crowding issue. But for all the bulge, this is not ideal at all. So Basically, we had to wait until a pipeline got developed to be able to, uh, to, to deal with this ultra-crowded photometry. And colleagues of mine, a colleague of mine, uh, Radek Kowalski and, and Matthew Penny, a former PhD student from here, and others helped crack that problem. And then I set my postdoc Ian McDonald to work on building a pipeline to detect free-floating planets from the data. And uh, it's quite, a, quite an ordeal to, to build a pipeline. Uh, so these are the steps if you want to, to look at all the steps of uh, re re um, rejecting poor data, rejecting asteroid tracks, all sorts of things had to be, had to be uh, rejected. Uh, so a very sophisticated pipeline before we ended up with, as you can see, five candidates. If I flip uh, back here, uh, this, is, this is a region where one of our events is seen. I'll talk about that in a moment so you can see how crowded it is. And, um, and the pipeline found 27 short time scale signals consistent with free floating planetary time scale events. Now, this same area was being simultaneously monitored from the ground intensively. So 23 of these, the 23 longest ones, had already been flagged from the ground. So they weren't new to us, although they were blindly recovered by this pipeline. But the four shortest signals were new discoveries, okay? And as far as we can see, they are consistent with Earth mass pre-floating planets. And then there was a fifth signal that I'll talk about in a moment. So the five remaining new candidates are shown here. So what you can see, the blue data is Kepler data. And then we've got a green best fit for a single lens model to it. And then the other data points, like the pink data points, is the ground-based data. You can see the quality of the ground-based data is much, much worse. Uh, the sampling is porous. There's no real way they, they were capable of detecting these kinds of events. The, you know, so one of the advantages of going into space, you can observe 24 hours a day, you can observe very, very densely, you're not interrupted by weather, you know, above the Earth's atmosphere, although with Kepler that wasn't you know, that wasn't a limiting factor. But you can see you know, the quality of the photometry is, is fantastic really densely covered. These, these events are over a day long, so really very short. Um, so we've got four candidates, pretty consistent with single lens microlensing, and then we've got this fifth one, and the blue track here shows this classic double horn that is associated normally with binary lens. Okay. So what was that fifth event? More later. Firstly, we're we'll comparing with models. So we ran, David ran his, the, the Mabel's model, that, that microlensing model, uh, to see what we would predict from uh, using Kepler sensitivity. 
Um, the detected events by the ground-based survey teams, which we uh, kind of uh, rediscovered, were shown by these dashed lines, so that's the 22 longer time scale events. And then we've got these four short ones here. And you can see they kind of form a, a kind of distinct population. And Kepler was sensitive to anything along that, along the sensitivity line, but there's a strong cluster there, and then apparently evidence of another cluster here. Now, if we look at predictions, the Sumia Tower prediction, so that was the one that was suggesting two Jupiter mass free floating planets for every star, that, that predicts an extra hump above and beyond this black line, which is no free floating planets, just microlensing by stars. Okay, so this is stars only. This red line is stars plus two Jupiter mass free floating planets per star. And then the blue is stars plus eight or five or ten. Earth mass free floating planets per star. So you can see this peak here is corresponds quite well with the position of this 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 subgroup which uh, which we've newly discovered with Kepler data. Now we still need to work out uh, our detection efficiencies, run those through, and you know completeness correct our samples so that we can actually directly compare our observations with these models. Okay, and that's that's something which. Uh, my current uh, uh, student, uh, Eva Nova, is going to start work on. She's just started with us. But that's exciting. That shows the potential of space based lensing, even with Kepler, even with something that's not suited uh, for this kind of work. So, this is the next frontier. These two missions, certainly this mission, this is NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. It's going to launch maybe 2026, 2027. Uh, it's uh, it's a mirror about the size of Hubble's mirror, and uh, but unlike Hubble, it's got a field of view a hundred times larger than Hubble. The same spatial resolution, in fact, yeah, same spatial resolution as Hubble. Near infrared hop optimized, so somewhere between kind of Hubble and JWST's kind of wavelength range, and uh, it will have a data rate twenty-four times that of JWST. So this is a massive survey facility. It's got three key priorities. One is cosmology, studying dark energy, things like that. Another is general astrophysics that will be you know, responsive to proposals from the community. And then the third is a core survey of looking for cool exoplanets with microlensing. Okay, so that's gonna occupy something around a third of its time. So that is a guaranteed survey. That's going to happen, uh, and that's going to be a major, major step forward for, for exoplanet studies. Euclid is something I'm involved with. Uh, so this is a dark energy mission. So again, it's primary science is cosmology, but it, it does. It, 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 uh, um, the red book, which describes its sort of mission intentions, uh, includes the uh, <coughs> additional science proposals. Okay, so. And there is a science working group dedicated to exoplanets, uh, which I currently uh, am deputy lead for, and I'm going to be the lead for it from uh, next March. And we are designing an exoplanet survey with Euclid that uh, some of it may take place uh, during commissioning, fingers crossed, um, but most would uh, take place after the main cosmology science, hopefully. Okay? Uh, it's going to depend on obviously what condition the mission is in and whether the cosmology is all done and so forth. But that's the hope. Uh, it has similar specifications to, to Roman, not as big a mirror, but it is near, there's a near infrared and visible camera, both very high resolution. Both have wide fields of view, half a square degree. It doesn't sound wide, but that is wide in, in you know, these apertures. Okay? So, uh, so these are amazing, both amazing facilities. They'll be able to take observations every kind of 15 minutes at the heart of the galactic center, above the Earth's atmosphere, they'll be able to image, you know, clearly image main sequence stars, giant stars, etc. So we'll have beautifully resolved stuff. So a bit like the CFHT image I, I showed previously, we'll have images more like this than like this, but we'll have space-based photometry quality of images like this. It's really amazing. So, uh, one of the objectives with surveys like Roman and Euclid, well, we, we want to know how planets form, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, talk in a moment about uh, how we're going to test that. Uh, we'll be able to say something about the galactic occurrence of habitable planets similar to Earth around stars similar to the Sun, so-called E to Earth. 
face of the abundance of <coughs> so-called Earth-like planets. Now, microlensing is sensitive to cool planets, typically from the outer edge of the habitable zone outwards. But the transit missions so far have been sensitive into the habitable zone, but only kind of the inner region of the habitable zone. They haven't been able to probe out to the outer habitable zone. So what this will tell us is the abundance just at the outer edge. Transits will have a, the abundance within the inner edge region, and we will interpolate reliably across that to get the first reliable estimates of planets within the habitable zones throughout our galaxy. Okay, so that's going to be a big step forward. Microlensing sensitivity to, to solar system-like planets means that we can probe the architectures of planetary systems that may be similar to ours and, uh, to, and, and find out just how unusual or usual our, our architecture is. And obviously, as I've just shown you, it's going to be a, a major boon for, for the uh, understanding of free-floating planet population. And these are, these are areas that, to which microlensing has unique access. Okay. It's, it's typically probing planets around low mass uh, stars. They're the most common stars in our galaxy. Uh, it's sensitive to planets right throughout the galaxy along the line of sight to the galactic center, so even very distant planets. So it's really probing a new regime uh, to other techniques. Oops. Okay, yeah, so I, I thought I was going backwards because I'm showing the same plot, but now we're pointing down at this one. What is this? Okay, we suspect it's a planet, and indeed, when we look at the uh, photometry in detail from uh, Kepler, this was a, a study led by my student David Specht. Uh, we've uh, it's, it's submitted to monthly notices, and we are very confident that this is the first ever detection of a bound planet uh, from space using microlens. Okay, so this is uh, this is our best fit curve to the space-based data, to the Kepler data. Um, but even better, Kepler at this time was about one AU away from Earth. We have a lot of ground-based uh, data looking at the same region of sky, but they had a different perspective. They were looking at the microlens geometry from a slightly different angle. So they had a different view. They had a different source trajectory across those core sticks. And so when we add in their data, we get two different light curves. So, um, so this multicolored data is a, a whole collection of ground-based surveys. We basically used all the ground-based data that was available. And the solid line here is our best fit to all the ground-based data. And the dashed line is the fit I just showed you to the Kepler data. And it's all to the same model. Okay, It's a simultaneous fit of two different data sets, or multiple data sets, in fact the same underlying lensing model. It's a beautiful confirmation. You can see that even the ground-based data captured the sharp downward turn, this caustic exit of the source star, and Kepler, of course, caught both entry and exit, um, and, well, indeed, everything, uh, really beautifully. So uh, our model comes out with you know, beautifully flat residuals, and uh, you know basically this is this is a twin of Jupiter in terms of its mass. It's almost exactly equal to a Jupiter mass. And in terms of its uh, distance from its host star, it's about 5 AU from its host star, pretty much the same as Jupiter. It's one of the closest analogues to Jupiter that has yet been found. Uh, but it is, it, it's a Kepler discovery, but it is twice as far away as the next furthest Kepler discovery. Because they're all from transits. This is the first one from microlensing. So we're, you know, opening up a, a completely new distance frontier um, with this telescope. Uh, again, they do this animation magic here. Uh, so you can see the source coming in here, getting multiply magnified this time. There's like five images being produced. This is the CFHC image. I've just sort of animated a brightening uh, here in a little rerun. And you'll see the light curve, the Kepler light curve, corresponding to that. OK, this is. A planet formation simulation. We're winding the clock forwards here, and we're seeing thousands of similar systems uh, being formed okay, as a function of time. Here's the mass of each of these simulated planets. Here's their separation. Each system had something like 50 planets around it. 
and forward models. These are state-of-the-art planet formation models. And I don't know if I can rerun this again. Yeah. Watch, watch this population here, these blue population. These are the hot planets, if you like, close in. This blue population, look at all these hot Jupiters. They start from far out, but then they get, they migrate inwards. Um, then we get, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a very massive, well, these are, these are sort of Neptune to Jupiters. These are super Jupiters up here. But the smaller mass ones at, at large separation stay put. Unlike everything else, these stay put. Where they form is where they still are. And so if we can get a, if we can get a, 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 if we can detect this population here, we can actually probe the birth locations of planets, free of messy migration dynamics. And microlensing is basically the only method that's going to be able to do that. This is the Kepler sensitivity. This is the sensitivity of NASA's Nancy Grace Rowe Space Telescope, and it'll be similar for nuclear. So we're probing this really super interesting regime. We, we probe these, these Jupiters. We probe this transition between planets that are mostly sort of terrestrial and rocky and those that have substantial icy components in their cores too. Because as you go further out, you're cooler. And so you know, the volatiles become, you know, can become solid. So these have solid uh, ices as well as rocks at their cores. Some of them accrete gas, and the, the more massive of those start to migrate inwards. The lower mass ones stay put. So these simulations have been performed as a, as a function of the mass of the host star. And what these, uh, what these groups find is that you basically never get Jupiters around stars less massive than about half a solar mass. A tiny few here. I mean, there are thousands of simulated systems here. Uh, and you only really start to get them once you're above that half solar mass threshold. Now, the planet we just found, the one planet we found at Kepler, was a Jupiter mass planet around a 0.6 solar mass star, very close to the threshold that these guys say you shouldn't really get Jupiters. They're too massive to form around such stars. So it's pretty intriguing to think what what uh, you know, Roman and what Euclid will find here, because it's, it's capable of finding thousands of planets in, in, this, uh, in this region. So, one area of interest will be this box here. Do we get Jupiters? How many Jupiters do we get? Another interest is this box here, where we transition from planets that have um, icy and rocky cores to planets that are pretty much just rocky. Okay, because there's a difference in terms of fluid fluid dynamics, if you think of this, the, the planetary disk as like a fluid, you know, fluid system, you've got icy, icy, rocky, you know, icy, dusty composition here and just dust here. So there's like a change in the, in, the, in the viscosity of the disk at that point where you're transitioning across the so-called snow line. And these simulations predict that actually, you, because of that change in viscosity, the migrating planets may tend to pile up here Okay, where it changes. And so that might explain the peak in the, in the uh, planet mass ratio that we see. So it'll be interesting to see whether that's confirmed. And then lastly, this box here where we're probing planets that never move from where they uh, form. So the state of play so far on the demographics of planets, the number of planets versus the, the mass of planets, from ground-based surveys is this rather noisy uh, green and red data here. Um, simulations of Roman, it used to be called W first, it's been renamed Roman, show for two different models just how those error bars will be improved. Okay, so we get really high fidelity statistics on the demographics from, from these surveys. So I'll quickly summarize, we're pretty much, I realize we're pretty much out of time. Obviously, a large abundance of planets have been found up to date, up to date, but and we know all pretty much all host stars, host planets. But I hope I've convinced you that actually we are still largely blind to a lot of planetary configurations, including architectures like our own. Microlensing will be essential to help remove some of that blindness. And Kepler, of all missions, a, tra a mission designed to find transits, has has kicked, you know, got the ball rolling, showing us the first exoplanet discovered from space using microlensing. It's, it's handing the baton over 
to the next generation of surveys like Roman and Euclid. These guys will be capable of detecting thousands of microlensing planets, measuring precise masses, distances, and kinematics for, for a large majority of them. They'll test planet formation theory in a way it's never been tested before, and hopefully they will reveal what is the true nature, if any, of these free floating planets. So, a quick plug, a lot of the work I've shown you here has been going on by Manchester. I think we really can say we're world leaders in this field. And if this kind of work interests you, I'm certainly on the lookout for a replacement for David uh, from next year. So uh, come and chat with me or drop me an email and we can have a chat if, if this uh, grabs you. Thanks for listening. Um, I'm interested about the, the micro lensing process, right? The lens move. So technically it is parallel, right? No, so um, the, the movement that gives rise to the signal is occurring on the scales of milli arc seconds, far too small to see. So you don't see a parallax effect on that movement because uh, it's too small. You can see if an event lasts a very, very long time, like a massive star or black hole or something like that, mm -hmm. you can see the geometry as the Earth goes around the sun and produce a geometric alteration to the, to the light curve. That, that has been seen sometimes. But the parallax here that I talked about, the two different light curves result because the ground-based observatories are on Earth and the space bay data is coming from Kepler at 1 AU from Earth. So they both mm -hmm. have different sight lines to the same event. So the image circle is at least one AU by that point, right? Because you can see it. Pro pro you're projected back to Earth. Okay? Uh -huh. So the, the Einstein radius, you have to kind of view it from the source star, project through the Einstein radius, and then carry on that projection onto Earth. Uh -huh. Okay. And if, if the separation of Earth and Kepler is significant compared to that projected Einstein radius, then you see noticeably different lines. So what's the resolution of that? Is that the Einstein, like, is it the lens resolution or the ground base? I mean, like, the detector resolution. Oh, the, the detector, so to see parallax, the key thing is that the baseline between the satellite and the Earth is not negligible compared to the Einstein radius projected back to Earth. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's kind of like the reverse of the picture I showed you before. Uh, it's hard to visualize it, but I appreciate it, but it's going to be, so the, the Einstein radius at the lens plane is of order an AU, a few AU. By the time it gets projected back to Earth, it's several AU. Mm -hmm. So a satellite that's one AU from Earth is going to see a different geometry. Thank you. Uh, you had the, uh, the sensitivity curves by Kepler and, uh, and Roman on one of the plots. Uh, to show like what kind of planets they'd be able to detect when they is it they would be able to detect anything within the thickness of the line or how much? Oh, inside, it's so inside the line. So, oh, so, above, so within the, line. the range of like yeah. the red area, within the range of the black area. Yeah, detect. so the exclusion okay. zone for Kepler would be here, the inclusion zone is here. Right, the okay. Room is here. And, yeah. I should okay. have made that clear. Any other questions? Okay, I'll go, I'll go with you first. Then. Yeah, um, about the icy, dusty pla uh, cold planets, um, is there a reason why they don't really migrate that much? Um, so, I, mm. yes, there is. So, the larger ones are large because they're accreting gas. Okay, and, and the more they accrete, if they have cores in excess of about 10 Earth masses, they undergo runaway accretion. They basically gobble up all the gas in their vicinity. But in doing so, you can imagine this gas is accreting and it, it introduces a viscous drag because it's still, you know, it's still interacting with the, the gas in the vicinity. And so the planet is undergoing this viscous drag that the, the remaining gas is dragging on it. And that drag means it loses angular momentum and moves inwards. Okay, in, in a classic, I mean, there are migration mechanisms where planets actually go the other way, but that's the classic migration mechanism makes them fall inwards. It's just a viscous drag of the gas that they're continuing to accumulate. The lower mass ones are accumulating little, if any, gas. The 
and so they're not subject to that, those sort of viscous strains. Did you have that? It's got a little bit. Okay, yeah. Um, so what you're actually detecting is when you're looking at microlensing, was that the, the light, light from background stars in the sense of the galaxy getting bent by a binary system of both the planet and the, the star of that system? Yeah, so, so um, the light curves I showed you, they're literally the light from the background star being multiply imaged, and we've yeah. just seen the combined light from those multiple images because they're, you know, they're separated on angular scales that are too small to separate out. So we can't, sep we can't see the separate images. We just okay. see the combined light from all of the images, which exceeds the unlensed light. So we see an overall magnification. Right. But, but the, the star of the system itself will also be emitting a lot of light, right? It could be. I mean, typically, they are the most common stars are low mass stars. So they don't have to be very far away to be quite invisible, actually, because they're okay. Because the, the mass luminosity relation is incredibly steep. So the luminosity goes to something like the, the three and a half powers of the mass. So it's extremely sensitive. But having said that, uh, Euclid and Roman are so sensitive, we are expecting actually to be able to detect flux from the lensing host several years, as, uh, you know, once it's moved sufficiently away from the bright background star. You know, after a few years, we'll see like a color change in the in the light of the background star, and, and the reason for that color change will be because of the separating out of the foreground star's flux. Yeah. And once we detect that, we'll know precisely the mass independently. We'll know the, the distance of the of the, the lens because you know the square law basically. The, you know, the fainter it is, the further yeah. it is for given mass, um, and so. We'll, we can use that to break some of the degeneracies that are inherent in modeling these things. There's a degeneracy typically in mass, distance, and velocity. So uh, we can use that lens light information to, to remove the distance degeneracy. Yeah. Okay, everybody had enough? I think I'll do a shot. So thanks for, thanks for hanging around.